Could you excuse the other one? Good morning, welcome. Good to see you today. I'm glad to have everybody here with us today on this day after, this Sunday after Thanksgiving. And last week we didn't have a Thanksgiving sermon, so I felt like the Lord was trying to direct me to uh, touch on the subject of giving thanks today. Uh, one of the chosen scriptures is Luke 17, verses 11 to 19. It's often preached on by pastors as a motivation for us to be grateful in our daily lives. And as we have had this national holiday, and we have turned aside from our work, and we've hopefully looked to the Lord God Almighty and thanked him for the blessings and provisions for us individually and as a nation, we continue in a long line of tradition in our country, because the pilgrims first celebrated Thanksgiving in 1621, and after a surviving a harrowing voyage in a difficult winter, and then since our founding, George Washington declared national and Abraham Lincoln also legalized it and memorialized it as a national holiday. Why? Because giving thanks is a good thing. Giving thanks is biblical because it allows us to recognize what God has done in and for us. And it's not only good for us, but it's good for the people around us. And we'll see, giving thanks is a command from God, which if we neglect can lead to irrational and sinful thinking and behavior. Often around our tables on Thanksgiving, we will have people share something that they're thankful for. Now, this particular Thanksgiving at my house, we were so scattered that we didn't get that done. I'm sorry to say. But last year, uh, I wanted to hearken back because one of the people that was at our table last year was John Snyder. I don't know if you remember John. He was a homeless person who had begun attending church here at First Christian. And he had gotten involved in an alpha group and he was one that we had invited to our house for Thanksgiving. And it was very touching to hear him talk about, while weeping, how being invited to be a part of the fellowship of the church and being accepted into that had led him to have a rekindled faith in God and a desire to walk with him and to know him better. Little did we know that within a month he'd be dead. How humbly it was to know that participating in our fellowship, he was also making peace with God. And so here's what you do. Turn to somebody near you or, and tell them what you're thankful for. Tell them just one thing you're thankful for. I mean, okay, go ahead. Do it. Tell them. Go ahead. You can do it. Well, that's more than one. I hope that I hope you were able to tell somebody that you were thankful for, and to hear what they were thankful. Yeah, when I was a kid. All right, now sit down, please. Please, enough rowdiness. When I was a kid, they used to say that the magic words were please and thank you. That's right, please and thank you. Not abracadabra, not open sesame. But please and thank you were the magic words. Now, as we look at this passage today, it's common for people to look at this and make it as, as, a, as a point that um, we should be grateful. So beginning in Luke 17, verse 11, it says, While he, he, that is Jesus, was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered the village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. 
Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell at his fa- on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now this word that's used in this text here is Eucharisteo. And the tense of it is to give thanks and to keep giving thanks. He was thanking him and thanking him and thanking him and thanking him and thanking him when he came back. Now, we just celebrated the Lord's Supper, and in some churches they refer to that as Eucharist. And it comes from this description that we read about in an earlier passage on communion about Jesus giving thanks for the bread and giving thanks for the wine and handing it to his disciples at his last Passover celebration with them. And this word Eucharisteo is used a lot in the New Testament. And I believe it is used so much because God wants to remind us through his word that we are to give thanks in all circumstances. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22, we read these words. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Thank you for that, Lord. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Note that it says, in everything give thanks, not for everything give thanks. This is the same Eucharisteo, to be thankful over and over and over again, that was used of the tenth leopard, the Samarian, who came back to thank Jesus. Now, a couple of years ago, I was challenged when I heard a message by a fellow who preached on 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, where it lists ungratefulness as a sin next to lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although that they have denied its power. Paul says, avoid such men as these. Kind of sounds like the drivers on I-95, doesn't it? (laughs) Right? Unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, without self-control. I read these passages and I realize that being thankful is not just a nice thing to do to get along with family and society. Because it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything, give thanks and keep giving thanks and be continually giving thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for us to be thankful. And if it is, when we are not being thankful, we're sinning. There's one scripture that says, he who knows what it is, what good it is to do and does not do it is sin to him. So right after this commandment that Paul gives not to quench the spirit, uh, not to, uh, to be thankful, he says, do not quench the spirit, which I take to mean that ungratefulness can interfere with the operation of the Spirit of God in our lives. We need the Spirit of God in our lives operating and His power in our lives in order to fulfill the Lord's plan for ourselves. 
So for me, this puts being thankful in an entirely different category. No longer is being thankful just a nice and pleasant thing to do, but it actually is a direct command from God about how we are to live our lives and to invite the presence of God into the situation. A few years ago, I heard someone say that Christians should always have an attitude of gratitude. And I thought that was a nice, catchy phrase at the time, that we should be grateful. But it does really capture the outlook that we believers should have. Because there's one more passage of Scripture. I want to go over to Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17, where we read, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so you also should forgive. Beyond all, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the cord of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Same word, Eucharisteo, same tense, to be continually and constantly giving thanks unto the Lord. Three times in those five verses, Paul says, be thankful. You think he means it? We are to be thankful as the Lord's beloved children and as being part of the body of Christ, we are to be thankful. Now, earlier I said that we should be thankful, as the passage says, in everything, but not necessarily for everything. Now, you may be guilty of it, I know I am, of when you hear a difficult situation, say a bad diagnosis or death of a loved one, and you want to be all theologically correct, you may have said something like this once, well, you should be thankful in this situation because it represents God's will. After all, he is sovereign over everything. Boy, that's like kicking somebody in the gut when they've gone through something, gotten really bad news. And the desire to be theologically correct is, is a nice thing, but sometimes we should keep our big fat yaps shut. Because Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we should accurately handle the word of truth and in these difficult types of situations, it's probably not a good idea to tell somebody, oh, you should be thankful for the fact that your wife just died. But wait, doesn't Paul say in Philippians 4, rejoice in the word, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice? Yes, he does. He wrote these words, Paul did, through the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, but it notice he says right after that, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. Beloved, when things are too much for us to handle, the Lord is near. We are not alone. God is near. I am not alone. He is with me, and he will stay with me through the situation all the way to the end. It is I who wanders off, not God. And it is I who must be careful not to allow myself to forget that God is near me, that God is with me, that I am not alone. And I have such a good forgetter, as I have often said. My typical reaction when faced with a challenging situation is to try to figure out a way to get myself out of it. I gotta figure out a solution to the problem. I go to thinking and organizing and planning so I can meet the challenges that I'm facing. But this is not the way the Lord wants us to live. The Lord did not save us from a life of sin and death to put us back under a performance lifestyle. He has demonstrated his love towards us by giving us Jesus 
who lived a life that we could not live and who could pay the debt that we could not pay and the penalty we could not pay through his sinless life and sacrifice for us so that we could be declared righteous. And he wants us to be set apart and to show the reality of him in this sin-sick world, but he doesn't expect us to do it by ourselves. The Lord is near. The Lord is with us. And at Christmas time, we celebrate the coming of Jesus, whose title was announced to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Next week, if you come, the place will all be decorated for Christmas. And you'll have some reminders of this. So we are to remember, beloved, that when we are facing situations that are beyond our abilities, that's when we're supposed to turn to the Lord. Recall the famous words of the 23rd Psalm, which I know that you all probably have memorized and love. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, it says, The Lord has said to the nation of Israel, Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or tremble at them, that is the people of the land. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He repeats it again in Deuteronomy 31, 8. He says it again in Joshua 1, 5. And he reiterates it in the New Testament in Hebrews 13, 5. God will not leave us or forsake us. That's good news. The Lord is with us. The reason that we can give thanks in every situation is that we can remember that we are not alone. And when the Lord allows us to be in these situations which our natural reaction is not to be thankful for, it's to do something for his glory and for the benefit of those who are around us who are looking at us and watching us. Think about Jesus that have read the, the passage for communion in Luke 22. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He knew what he was facing. He shortly went to the Garden of Gethsemane after that and prayed that if God could do it some other way, that he should do it the other way because he didn't want to go through what he was going to have to go through. But guess what? The Lord was with him. I mean, he had just washed Judas's feet who was going to betray him. This same pattern of Jesus giving thanks at the Last Supper is repeated not only in Luke, but also in Matthew and in Mark and in John and in Paul's description of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you were to go through the New Testament and look at every instance where the gospel writers or uh, those who wrote the epistles said, give thanks, you'd find it a lot. For example, when Jesus fed the 4,000, recorded in Matthew 15, he took a seven loaves and a few small fish, and he gave thanks, and he broke them. And he gave them to his disciples who fed an entire multitude. As we, as we follow Jesus, and he goes to the garden, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, he doesn't say some canned prayer. He doesn't have a piece of paper with him that he's reciting off of. He is talking to his heavenly father because his father was with him. He cries out earnestly and he is heard. A couple of weeks ago I preached on how we are to be dependent on the Lord through prayer to do the things that we are not able to do. And I related it to my experience as a group leader in a prison retreat. One of the things that the Lord taught me through that retreat was he was there with me. I, was, I kept praying. I said, Lord, what do you want me to say to these guys? Because I wanted to try to get through to them, you know? I was waiting. Pray. 
Lord, is there an illustration? Is there a story? Is there something from my own life that I can share with them? Which one should I use, Lord? Pray. You know, it was interesting to me. The Lord was there. He was in the situation. He was present with those five guys in my group, and he touched all of their hearts, but it wasn't because I did anything other than I prayed. He was there, and he did something. I mean, I thought, I mean, I have a lot of experience of things. I have a lot of wisdom to share and all that. The Lord didn't need any of that. Instead, he used my prayers to break down the unseen walls and to remove the unseen spiritual opposition. And glory to God, he did whatever needed to be done. The reason we can be thankful is that the Lord is with us and he will do the work for us. We don't have to be thankful for the situation, but we can be thankful in the situation because we do not face it alone. I know some people, when they face very, very difficult situations, it says uh, in one place that the Lord will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation or the testing, make a way to escape. I've known people who said, I don't believe that scripture, because the Lord has put me through some testing that I couldn't handle. But I think to myself, and I don't say it out loud because I don't want to be insensitive, but I think to myself, but you've made it through. Here you are. You're talking to me about it. Part of the reason that we, as a congregation, celebrate the Lord's Supper every week is we need to remind ourselves that the Lord is with us. We are not alone. When we leave the walls of this church and we enter into the mission field, we go so out these doors with the Spirit of God living in us. And throughout the whole New Testament, you will find this word, Eucharisteo. As I said, the lone Samaritan. When Jesus was the tomb, at the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he thanked God. In every description I said of the Last Supper, he broke bread and gave thanks. In the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, he gave thanks. In the end, at Emmaus, when he broke the bread, he gave thanks, and the disciples recognized him. The church of Jerusalem gave thanks to God for the collection on behalf of the other churches. You can't avoid it. It's everywhere there. People are giving thanks. People are changed and they give thanks. People give thanks and they're changed. Okay, you say, I can go along with the idea that we are to thank God in everything because he is with us. But that doesn't mean that is it a command or to be ungrateful is a sin, you might say. That is a fair observation. But consider Romans, where Paul describes the awful effects on people who fail to give thanks. He writes, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculation and their foolish hearts were darkened. Giving thanks is not a mere formality or pleasantry. Serious obligation. Paul goes on in this passage to say, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible men and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The result of ingratitude is to give ourselves over to wrong thinking, which leads us away from the worship of God and a relationship with God. I've seen it many times, and I'm sure you have, where a person has a loved one who is sick. He calls on the Lord to heal the loved one, and for whatever reason, the loved one is not healed, maybe dying. Now the person is shocked and disappointed and offended and angry. They gave God his chance. <clears throat> they trusted him. They believed in their hearts. 
And so they begin to believe a lie. God isn't good. God doesn't love me. God isn't real. And since I cannot rely upon the church and the God that they profess in, I just have to make, make it in life on my own. Or if it's some other type of disappointment, like a failed career or a, a love interest that didn't work out or an accident or a physical calamity that has long-lasting consequences, it can likewise re result in a person turning away from the Lord and wandering off into a world in which they must find their own solutions to their problems. Or worse yet, just end it all because life isn't worth living if this is the way it is. This gratefulness thing is very important. When we count God out of our lives and do not acknowledge him in the circumstances, do not acknowledge him as near, then we err. And we miss the life that the Lord has for us with sweet fellowship with him and his people. There is a different way. Think of how we gather together at memorials and funerals. We rejoice over the life of our loved ones and we break bread together. When someone has a serious operation, we take food to their houses and support them through the recovery by praying for them and being with them in those situations where practical help is needed. This is why we, as the people of God, gather together the Lord being in us and with us in everything. So we just, as I said, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, which is supposed to be a time of remembrance and reflection on the Lord's goodness and provision. And let us not forget what we have known since the founding of our country, that in spite of our losses, disagreements, sometimes shameful behavior, and national sins, or what Lincoln called the national perverseness and disobedience, we can instead focus on his final words of creating thanksgiving, that we would, quote, fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to fulfill I'm sorry, to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, and tranquility in the Union. Do you think as a country we need to learn how to give thanks? I think as a church we need to learn how to give thanks. And the reason we give thanks is we are not alone. He will not forsake us or leave us. He is with us. He's with us when we're riding in our cars. He's with us when we're sitting at our desk. He's with us when we're sitting in our house, or when we're walking in the way, or when we're rising up, or when we're lying down. And we are to remember these things at all times. And it's not just a New Testament thing. In the Old Testament, in Psalms 92.1, it says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. In 1 Chronicles 16, it says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Hallelujah. If you make a study of thankfulness in the scripture, you will find that it is a recurring theme throughout, from Genesis to maps. Well, maybe not in maps. So, as a practical exercise, I have asked George if he would hand out thank you cards. Did you get thank you cards when you came in? Okay, what I want you to do is now we're going to take five minutes, maybe not even, and I want you to think of one person that you need to write a thank you note to. George, you back there? If, okay, I, I think we've got some people up here in the front who don't have a thank you note. And if there's anybody who doesn't have one, just raise your hand. And George will get you a thank you note. What I want you to do is ask the Lord to show you somebody who you need to express some thanks to or some gratitude to. And I want you to write their name down on, on the outside of the envelope and write your name on the, where the return address goes so if you get lost, we can return it to you. And you won't forget who it is that the Lord brought to your mind. But I want you to take a few minutes 
to begin a thank you note. I'm not going to give you enough time to write everything that you want to write because we, I don't, I don't want to go late. I want to respect your time. But I want you today, as an act of obedience to the Lord, to be thankful, to be grateful. You just did it a minute ago when you turned to somebody and told them something you were thankful for. It wasn't so hard, was it? Did you break a sweat doing that? So I, it is important for us to thank people who are in our lives who benefit us, who have blessed us. I remember one of the things I did when I was a young man is I wrote a, a bunch of my old teachers to thank them for putting up with me. I was a pretty difficult child, I bouncing all over the place in class. And, and it was a good thing for me to do that. And it blessed those teachers. And they were happy for it. Or maybe it was a coach. Or maybe it was a, it's a parent. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a kid. Maybe it's, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor. Maybe it'll remind you to take back what you borrowed from your neighbor who lent you that tool or whatever. I'll just give you a minute to think about it. All right, I'm going to stop you there because I want to get out of here at a decent time. But you have some homework. You need to go home and finish that note and stick a stamp on it or take it to the person's house and shove it in their door or whatever so that they'll get it from you when, uh, where you found it or where you, where you put it. Because so often there are people that the Lord has put into our lives that we don't acknowledge as benefiting us. And beloved, we all need a word of encouragement. Do you need a word of encouragement sometimes? Yeah. And that note will lift somebody's spirits and will make them think, wow. So they really did know. They really did notice that I did something. Because the Lord says to us, many, many times, in many, many places, and over and over and over again, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I hope that today you will begin anew to recognize that you can give thanks in everything, not for everything, but in everything, because the Lord is near because the Lord is with us. I know in my work, when I'm feverishly trying to do something and trying to write something, and, and I'm like not making it, and I just stop and I turn to the Lord and I say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, now anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. 
and I go back to what I'm doing, and the Lord is in it, and he guides me, and he directs me. Beloved, you are not alone. If you have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, the very Spirit of God dwells in you. So today you realize for the first time that the Lord is calling you to himself, or if you realize that you wandered off and you need to get back to him, then come forward as we sing. I'm going to have uh, ask the band to come forward and sing an invitation song. And, and I hope and I pray that today that we will be known as, from this day forward, we'll be known as people who are characterized by our gratefulness and our thankfulness. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you saw our need, that you gave us the law as a schoolmaster to show us that by the law no person will be justified, that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ who took on flesh and dwelt among us, that he could live the life that we could not live so he, and he could die the death that we could not die in order that we might know you and have a way to you. I thank you, Lord, that you are with us.